Good morning and welcome to uh, Sunbury Baptist Church Online. Good to have you with us on this first uh, Sunday of May. It feels uh, like winter time has already arrived, but uh, hopefully in the not too distant future we'll be back here gathered together and being able to worship in this place. So thank you for joining us online and uh, we look forward to the service today. Our first uh, song today is called Shine, Jesus, Shine. And I know there's quite a few of you. This is your favorite. So sing along as we, uh, as we worship the Lord and invite Jesus to shine through our lives. During this time of uh, restrictions uh, that's affected the life of the church, 
many of the ministries have found a way to continue. And this morning I've asked some of our ministry leaders uh, in different capacities to share with us what are some of the things they've had to adjust to and adapt to in ministry uh, as they've continued to do uh, what they do, whether it's youth group or children's ministry or home Bible study groups. So uh, here's a number of people sharing uh, what it means to adapt to change in ministry. Hi everybody, my name's Greg Wells and I'm part of the Sunbury Baptist Church. Um, one of the things I do at the Sunbury Baptist Church is I'm a home group leader. What that means is each second week I get together with uh, a group of other people. Um, and previously we were catching up at someone's house every second week face to face. Um, but the challenge in the COVID-19 period has been how to catch up and so what we've learned to do is to catch up over uh, Zoom meetings, which has been really neat. And what we've learned to do is how to use the computer and we're still catching up as we had before the um, lockdown and uh, that's been challenging for some of us as in, as in hosting, but also for some of, the, uh, some of the folks that are less computer literate. But the good thing has been that we've been able to stay connected and we're, we're doing a study as well about prayer at the moment and we've studied all sorts of things about praying for ourselves but also praying for other people or other situations in the last couple of weeks and it's been really neat to hear people's experiences and then pray with each other. So we're going to continue doing that for uh, the rest of the term, you know, study every two weeks and by about the end of this term we will have finished that uh, study which is one from prayer.org. It's been great. We've uh, continued to connect with each other each couple of weeks and uh, we're going to continue to do that. My name is Jill and um, I've been um, heading up the Children's Church at uh, Sydney Baptist but with a difference. So um, over the past few weeks uh, we started off um, pretty well running um, a social group for the for the children just to connect um, with each other socially um, and have a bit of a chat um, and then basically from Easter um, we started um, putting a little bit more structure into it so um, we'll have a prayer time with the children we'll have a mission spot um, and um, we will pull up a, a Bible story which um, is a video um, for them, um, pull up a song and what's really funny is that um, everybody loves to enjoy a bit of a dance while the song's on um, and, and so yeah they dance around their lounge rooms um, and then yeah we, we tend to find something for them to be doing during the week so a craft activity um, that they can do so um, Dan's been, been great in co-hosting that and um, yeah, the, the children really enjoy being able to, to speak with each other um, and with us. Um, and it's just been wonderful to be able to still connect um, on that level. So, yeah, really, really enjoy doing that. Yeah, each um, week we probably um, have between about 12 and 14 children um, on, our, on our Zoom session. Hi, I'm Carl. And... Uh... Gabriel and I are working with the Sunday youth. These are uh, teenagers that uh, uh, normally come along to Sunbury Baptist Church. And uh, well, because we can't come along together, we're having to do our sessions over Zoom at the moment. So um, we started at the beginning of this year looking into the life of Joseph. And uh, funnily enough, um, just when we had to go down into isolation, uh, Joseph went into prison and he was also isolated from uh, uh, people around him. And in fact, he's been isolated uh, from his family down in Egypt for uh, many years. So uh, it's been quite uh, topical and applicable. So each, um, each fortnight we get together, uh, we've played an online game, Scribble, a bit of like a Pictionary, just to have a bit of uh, fun together. Uh, different ones have talked about uh, things they've done during the, their week or how they've coped with uh, schooling at home. And, uh, and then we go through uh, another chapter of the story of, of Joseph and uh, have some questions, have some discussions, and then finish off by praying uh, for each other. 
and uh, it's it's really brilliant and uh, uh, it's great to see the kids interacting with each other and uh, becoming familiar with uh, communicating over zoom and uh, and it's so great to connect even though we are physically isolated from each other and uh, and it's also brilliant just to be able to spend this time uh, looking into God's word with these young people because it it's such an important part of their uh, their lives that they're growing up. So thank you and uh, keep praying for us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name's Rosemary Tyres. This term's been a very good term, but has been a challenge. We decided, Joanne and I, that we would um, do a Bible study that was online and if you want to join us, you can. It's this one, which, can you see that? It's called The Rock, The Road and The Rabbi. And if you get onto Study Ways, and here's a picture, if you get onto Study Ways, you'll be able to join us if you want to or do it by yourself. Um, it's been a challenge because we didn't know how we were going to do it. Um, I've provided a DVD for those that needed to have it because they couldn't get onto the internet. Um, and I downloaded a study for them, which we have, which they have been doing. So we've, this is our second week. Now we, ha we had an issue because a lot of people couldn't use Zoom or didn't have a computer that would do Zoom. So what we've done is we have decided that we would break the group up into prayer groups to pray. So we'd have two people and that in two weeks, we'd be, that would be our prayer partner. So we'd be praying for them, talking about the video and the questions that that might have because a lot of it is um, about the Jewish idea. The Jewish idea. The rabbi talks about how it, how the, say, Jesus' birth in Beth have been in the cave what significance it had for the Jewish people and I've got a lot out of the study myself already I have done it already so we knew what we were doing but each fortnight we have a prayer partner mine at the moment is Christy and we are um, and I ring her regularly I try and ring all the people in the group because not everybody um, is able to, to do Zoom. So that's the way we decided we do it so that I'm regularly in contact and people just message me with their prayer, prayers for the week if they want to. And that's what we're doing to keep in contact with each other. If you want to belong to uh, become part of our group, just for this segment, um, please contact Sunbury Baptist Church office and they will notify me who, who you are and I'll get in contact with you. Hello, Sunbury Baptist. Um, I'm Kerry and Mark and I run the youth groups on Friday nights. Um, we've been continuing uh, through the COVID uh, situation and we've actually been having a really enjoyable time with the youth. We've been using the Zoom platform and we've been just spending a bit of time with them and letting them talk through some of the things that they're dealing with. And they, they like to talk about their schooling and how that's going for them. Um, pets can be shown off. I'm not sure what that's about, but it's good fun. Um, and then we usually share a message with them um, and we pray for them as well. We have about, about 11 between eight and 11 kids that are joining and um, some of them are Christian children and some of them are from outside of Sunbury Baptist as well, which is quite exciting. Gives us an opportunity to reach some um, other folk and we play some really fun games online. Um, when we're in the building, they love to play hide and seek. I don't think it matters how old you are. When someone says it's time for hide and seek, everybody gets involved. 
even Mark and I get involved, Rachel gets involved when she's there and we all go play hide and seek. So we decided we would try and do a similar thing um, online and we pulled up a virtual tour of uh, Smithsonian Institute and the kids all had an opportunity to hide in different areas and then there was a seeker that would try and um, find where everybody was hiding. That was great fun. And we've played some um, games, uh, like online Pictionary games, and we've been doing some searches for what we're going to do this Friday. So we've really just been having a lot of fun. Um, the kids don't seem to want to stop. We keep thinking there needs to be an end point on the evening, but they just keep wanting to carry on and do more. So it's actually been a a really exciting experience and um, we're looking forward to pulling all those kids and more back in on Friday nights when we're back in the building. Thank you to all of our participants this morning in adapting to changes in ministry. To Greg, to Jill, Carl, Rosie and Kerry. This morning I want to share with you three uh, different scripture readings. Uh, two from uh, Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 26. And then one from John's Gospel, chapter 21, which is um, uh, all, all to do with Peter. Um, so as we, as we work through these three readings, you'll see the three phases of, of Peter's life uh, as he deals with his own um, denial of Jesus and the recovery from that. So let's pick the reading up this morning. Our first reading is Matthew 26, reading from verses 31 to 35. Then Jesus told them, this very night you'll all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you, and all the other disciples said the same. So the second reading then comes to the time when Peter actually disowns Jesus. It's in verse 69 of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you're one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The third reading comes from John's Gospel, chapter 21, and verses 15 and following. This is the time when, when Jesus uh, meets with, with Peter um, after his resurrection, and they've gone up to Galilee. Uh, Peter's been out fishing with the others during the night. And Jesus comes to the shore and they have breakfast on the shore. So it's at this encounter with between Jesus and, uh, and Peter. So John 21 and verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is God's word and we'll come to it in the message as we talk about Peter's life and his experience of the risen Lord. 
The next uh, song that we're going to sing is called uh, King of My Heart. Join us as we worship the Lord and claim Him as Lord of our lives and Lord of our hearts. Morning, dear church, missing you all, but we'll look forward to seeing each other soon. Let us pray as we hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in John 20, 19. In the evening, that same day, the first day of the week, when the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors, out of fear of the Judeans, Jesus came and stood in the middle and said, Peace be with you. So we pray, Lord Jesus, here we all are, gathered together, 
each in our own homes, isolated, in lockdown, for fear of the virus. And the Lord Jesus is with us in our midst right now. And we hear him say to each one of us, peace be with you. Oh, Lord God, you are sovereign. You are Lord of all. You've won the victory. We declare you Lord of Lords, King of Kings. And we bow in worship before you. We exalt you, Lord God, and worship at your footstool. For you are holy, the Holy One of Israel. And because you are full of compassion, you forgive us our sin as we confess it before you. And you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, God, for remembering that we are flesh. Lord God, we bring our fears and our concerns to you. And hear you say through the prophet Isaiah, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Lord, we see the coronavirus in terms of David and Goliath. The giant is being slain by the prayers of the people through the declaration of the mighty power of God. How we thank you that we have a Christian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who looks to you, who spends time on his knees before you and so receives wisdom and understanding and guidance from you. So we join with him and all other Christian leaders this morning, coming in the mighty name of Jesus and asking for the end of this pandemic through the name which is above all names. We ask that we in Australia and the whole world may live in peace and freedom again as we humble ourselves before you. We pray that in this time of isolation and quietness, as the world ceases from most of its normal activities, that you would reveal yourself to us, to the whole world. Reveal yourself profoundly as we seek you, becoming aware of your presence in our midst. We pray for all in authority, making far-reaching decisions. Families struggling to put food on the table. Students doing school online and the teachers preparing for them and the parents at home trying to help. We pray for those in food banks and care works and charities supporting the vulnerable, those without homes or food. Father, we pray for each precious person in need, in isolation and working, and we pray that you would renew and restore and bring reconciliation at this time. We praise you, Lord, for the protection of Indigenous people, especially those in remote communities where we see your hand at work, and we thank you for your presence among them. We pray for the protection of the great continents of the people of Africa and India. We cry out to you for the persecuted church worldwide. O oh Lord, provide strength and courage to them in their time of need. 
We pray for each one of our missionaries. We lift them up to you, Father. They are so often on our hearts. We pray especially today for Melissa Barclay as she serves the people of Arnhem Land with MAF. Father, we lift up Paul and Dawn here in Sunbury, serving as with the hands and feet of Jesus. Establish the work of, the, of their hands, we pray. Pour your Holy Spirit over them. Refresh them. Enable them to fulfil the calling here in Sunbury as they encourage us and the community. Bless them, Lord, and their loving family. We pray too for the board of SBC and we ask that they would seek your face at this time, working together in unity and love to lift you up and further your kingdom in this place. We thank you, Father, for Ben Riley making all these transmissions online possible and for enabling Fern and Ray's wedding to be seen by their family and friends, even in Brazil. Father, may your living water refresh us. May the bread of life feed us. May we know your hope and your joy and share it. Father, we bring those we love before you now. We name them, Father, as we ask for your healing and your comfort and your provision for those we love. Lord Jesus, Lamb of God, we thank you for the gift of the cross, for your blood which sets us free. We thank you for your resurrection power, which gives us life in abundance. We praise you, we bless you, we honour you, we love you, Lord. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Lois, for uh, leading us as a family in prayer this morning. Uh, appreciate that. And a reminder, by the way, that uh, tonight, this is May the 4th, uh, we have a prayer meeting uh, with the church, and uh, that's a Zoom prayer meeting. Now, if you don't have details of the Zoom meeting, please contact myself or Dawn, uh, any of the board members, um, whoever's contact detail you want to, we will get it to you by, by today. So if you want to be part of that live Zoom prayer meeting, we'd love to have you there. We had a few people last time, and we'd just like to increase the number of people who are gathering for prayer and sharing uh, for prayer over the church and over the situation that's happening around us. In this uh, series of messages that we've been uh, talking about for, since Easter Sunday, uh, and I want to continue this to the day of Pentecost uh, for, I hope, obvious reasons that when we ask the question, what is the difference that the resurrection of Jesus makes, of course, one of the big answers has to be the coming of the Holy Spirit. So in this, in this period of time, in this series that I'm doing with you from Easter Sunday to Pentecost, we're asking the question, of the relevance or the, the power, the impact of Jesus' life on our lives, on the life of the church, on the life of the world, and the personal, in a personal sense, in a sense for the church, in a sense for our whole community and for our nation. We saw how on Easter Sunday, Jesus made a huge difference to two discouraged, downhearted, depressed disciples who were walking on the road to Emmaus, having lost hope and living with the despair of uh, seeing Jesus uh, crucified and buried, they were without hope. And yet uh, Jesus came alongside them and he encouraged them and he revealed himself to them. He made a personal appearance to Thomas a week later 
And we saw that uh, just a couple of weeks ago. We were looking at Thomas's life and the way in which he doubted and uh, didn't believe that Jesus had rose, uh, risen from the dead. And we, uh, we looked at Thomas's life and his doubts and the way in which in the end, through a personal encounter with Jesus, through that risen Lord encounter, uh, his life was turned around and he worshipped him and called him his Lord and God. And then last week we took a bit of a theological excursion into Romans 8, which is um, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, explaining to us the, the consequences, the, the way in which Jesus' death and resurrection has changed things for us when he writes in Romans 8 uh, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For he set us free from the law of sin and death and given us and brought us to the law of spirit of life in the spirit. So the death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, the one who had no sin, who became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Bible tells us that he took our sins in his body on the tree, that he suffered in our place so that we could be rescued from death and restored to life in him and with him. This morning, uh, I want to do something a little bit different because technology allows us to do it. I want to cross over to uh, live uh, to Simon Peter in Galilee. I'm using a bit of preacher's license this morning. You'll see what I mean in a few moments. But uh, Peter's waiting for me. And uh, I've asked him this question so that he can think about it and respond to the question, what difference did it make to you the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Paul, well, thank you for... Uh asking me the question concerning the resurrection of Jesus. And I see that, uh, that you've read out the stories already recorded in the Gospels to the people. So um, obviously in asking me the question, you're making it very personal. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to answer that. You know, if it wasn't for the forgiveness that I know from Jesus, uh, bringing up my past would be very painful bringing up the thing that uh, probably would have caused me the most shame in my life would be extremely difficult to talk about. Uh, let, let me just put a little bit of context though around uh, this question about the resurrection of Jesus from my life. I was a self-employed fisherman uh, on the Sea of Galilee and involved in a fishing business in partnership with the sons of Zebedee, James and John. Uh, one day Jesus of Nazareth came by and uh, he challenged us about fishing on the other side of the boat when we hadn't caught anything all night. And a miraculous catch of fish convinced us that Jesus really was uh, who he said he was, the Messiah. And he challenged us to leave everything we had and to, to follow him. So it, it began a journey for me. Um, I was up for it, as, uh, as you probably know from some of my personality recorded in the Gospels that uh, whenever there was a challenge up, I was usually one that was willing to take it. But three, three years on the road with Jesus, um, and you've read in the book, uh, you, you get the picture of what that journey was, uh, was really like in many ways. Um, I like the way my friend John uh, ended his biography about Jesus. He said with these words, he said, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Certainly, there's a lot of things uh, that Jesus did and said that uh, we couldn't capture. But I just want to share with you that over those three years that we spent on the road with him from Galilee to Judea, via Samaria, uh, and in many other places around as we walked with Jesus, um, I must say that I became uh, very loyal to Jesus. Uh, in fact, I developed a, a sense that I was more loyal than anyone else. If uh, Jesus was walking on the water towards the boat, uh, I was the one to get out of the boat and, uh, and go and try and walk to him. Although only a few steps, I think the rest were in the boat considering the, uh, the safety rules and the processes that had to be adhered to. When Jesus asked us the question, uh, who do you think that I am? I was the one who said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus commended that answer. And he said that he'd build his church on a rock solid foundation of that confession. Even though there was opposition to Jesus, there was growing up 
I always believed in the Messiah. I always believed that uh, he really was the one and that, that he was the one to bring the kingdom to Israel, that nothing, that nothing could stop him. Uh, that he was the one, he, he proved himself in all the miracles that he did for us, as did around us, that we saw, that we witnessed uh, absolutely amazing miracles, multiplying bread, um, cleansing lepers, raising Lazarus from the dead. Um, my mother-in-law raised from a fever uh, miraculously. Um, Jairus's daughter raised from the dead. So many things that convinced us that Jesus was actually who he said he was. And uh, then in the midst of all that, though there was opposition, he started talking about dying and being handed over to the elders to be put to death. I remember taking him aside one day and saying, Jesus, you've got to stop talking about dying. His reply to me made me think that he was addressing Satan directly when he said, get behind me, Satan, for you don't know the purposes of God. The night before Jesus was crucified on the cross, we were celebrating the Passover with Jesus. For those of you who read the story, you know what was coming next. But for us who were sharing that meal, we really had no idea what the next day would mean. We were just celebrating another Passover with the one we loved. Again, he started speaking about his death. And this time he gave a prediction about our loyalty to him. He said, this very night, you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Well, my response to Jesus' prophetic words was probably predictable, if you know something of my character. I said, even if everyone else deserts you, Lord, even if there's no one else who will stay with you, I never will. I never will. And Jesus made it very personal. He said, this very night before the cock crows, Peter, you will disown me three times. I could have been humbled by these words, but I wasn't done with my pride yet. I was in a state of uh, wanting to prove how loyal I was. So as usual, I jumped in boots and all and said to Jesus on that night, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you because at that point all the other disciples chimed in and they agreed including judas before you can understand what jesus being alive and personal means to me you have to try to imagine what the crowing of a rooster early in the morning can do to your soul to shatter all of your defenses and pride i wonder if you've ever had an experience like that morning I had on the morning when Jesus was crucified, when, when that rooster crowed three, uh, when I denied him three times, I was absolutely shattered because at that moment, all of my pride and all of my loyalty and all of the things that I had attested to Jesus, I would never disown him, that I would stand with him even after he predicted that I'd deny him, I was completely shattered. When that rooster crowed, Jesus looked at me. And in that moment, I knew that I was undone. There was nowhere to hide, no one else to blame, no escape from shame and guilt. The very thing I said I would never do, I had done. I was devastated and shattered. Then the unimaginable happened. Um, you know the story because you've read it. And you've been talking about it recently. But when Jesus rose from the dead, we were very surprised. It was something that even though on reflection he had predicted and said would happen, uh, we just were absolutely amazed that not only was he alive, but he appeared to us showed himself to be alive, uh, let us eat with him and touch him and uh, put our hands into his hands. Uh, Thomas, as uh, you recall from the gospel stories, was um, not convinced at first because he wasn't with us. But when he was with us, Jesus made it very personal for him as well. Only, uh, only my friend John 
uh, records the third part of this story. And that is the, uh, the time when Jesus met us right here on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, that particular day, um, I'll never forget. Three times Jesus asked me the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? When he asked those, those questions, uh, they had a devastating ring to them because I was living with a conscience that said I had let him down. That even though he was alive, even though he had risen from the dead, I had still denied him. In the hour of need, in the hour of testing, uh, I was found to be wanting, that my pride had got in the way, and that I was the one who had said I didn't even know him. And now here he was standing before me asking me the question, Simon, do you love me? Three times he asked me, do you love me? Three times I had to say, Lord, you know that I love you. And three times he said, take care of my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. In other words, lead the people that would come to faith and follow me. You be my leader. Then he went on to predict how my death would glorify him. This time I didn't have a response because I knew from experience that when Jesus spoke about my future, that he was right. And uh, that not only was he alive now, but he was also my friend. What does Jesus' resurrection mean to me? Well, it means that I'm forgiven. It means that I'm restored to a relationship with him, that my own sin has been forgiven, and that by his presence in my life, by the fact that Jesus actually appeared to me and made himself known to me, I know that I can forgive myself. I can move on from pride and from that place of relying on what I can do to rely on the fact that Jesus uh, will, will live his life through me by his spirit. I have a relationship with God as Father, just like Jesus showed us to live in relationship with the Father. And I've been restored to a purpose. I have a reason to live, to proclaim Jesus, to make him known for the rest of my life. So thank you, Paul, for asking me the question. Um, I know it's a long answer, but um, the resurrection of Jesus has completely and utterly changed my life, my purpose and my direction. So thank you for asking. Thank you, uh, Simon Peter, for sharing with us this morning. Uh, lovely to see the Sea of Galilee behind you there as you uh, uh, shared with us your story. And uh, coming back to us as we think about uh, Peter's life and as we think about his story and his experience of the, of the risen Lord, um, we are not going to get a chance in our lifetime uh, to walk physically with Jesus as, as the one who's alive and to do what Thomas did, to put our hands into, into the hands of Jesus, uh, to hear Jesus uh, physically being before us and speaking to us. But the question for us uh, is still as relevant as it was for Peter. What, what difference does the resurrection of Jesus make? What, what, does, what does that event of the past, that history, what difference does it make to our lives? And uh, if I can just quote what, what Peter was saying, I am forgiven for my own sin and wrongdoing against Jesus. One of the things that I hope that the resurrection of Jesus does for you is to understand that your sins are forgiven. I, uh, I was thinking about this whole um, awareness of sin, the need for forgiveness, the actual receiving of forgiveness and the restoration that follows. And uh, it just occurred to me, it's a little bit like someone, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, uh, the TV series Bondi Rescue. But on Bondi Rescue, you know, all these people are there at the beach and imagine just this young, maybe healthy bloke who decides he's going to charge out into the waves and uh, th there, are, there are flags there for him to go between and he's meant to stay between the flags. But, you know, you get out there in the waves and the bigger ones are just off to the side. They're just and he's having such a good time riding them in and just going straight back out. And suddenly he discovers that uh, he's no longer between the flags and he's also no longer in reach with the ground. In fact, every time he tries to catch a wave, 
he's taken out. That's called a rip. Not by accident it's called a rip, it's called rest in peace. <laughs> Often that, uh, that's how it ends up. So the guy ends up, he's struggling against this, this rip, being taken out into the deep. And at some point, uh, his bravado uh, it begins to diminish, his strength starts to ebb, and he puts his hand up to sort of indicate to this, the, the lifeguards that he's in trouble. Uh, and so uh, it gets a bit frantic because they've actually got to see him first and then run their rescue uh, boats or um, paddle out to him on a paddleboard and, and pick this guy up out of the water. By the time they get there, he's going down for the third time. He's, he's sucked in a lot of water and they just grab him out of the water, take him on the paddleboard and he, he passes out. When he, when he comes to, when he recovers uh, his breath and comes to, he wonders how on earth he got onto the beach. But he's very grateful that someone has rescued him. To some extent, when you, when you look at Peter's life and his encounter with Jesus, it's kind of a little bit like that. There's a, a sense in which when Peter uh, began to follow Jesus, he was full of bravado. Uh, he understood the laws of God. He understood that they were waiting for Messiah. And he was Jesus. And he gets to be one of the 12. He gets to be one of the, 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 the inner circle of people who are following Jesus with all the hopes of Israel, with all the, the aspirations of Israel being free from Rome, being able to establish God's kingdom on earth. And, and Peter is always the first one to jump in, as, as he said it himself. You know, if, if someone was going to jump out of the boat and walk on water, it was going to be, it was going to be Peter. If someone was going to answer for the rest and say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, it would be, it would be Peter. If someone was going to ask the question, how often do we have to forgive people? Yep, it was going to be Peter. And so when, when they were challenged by Jesus at the Last Supper to the fact that they would all scatter when Jesus uh, was arrested, when he, when he came, when, the, when the, they strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. When that was fulfilled, Jesus was talking to all of them. It was Peter who said, even if everyone else abandons you, I will not. And so Peter's kind of uh, growing in his confidence in what he can do and, and who he is as a, an apostle, as a, as a disciple of Jesus, as a follower of Jesus. And he hasn't got to that brokenness. He hasn't got to that place where, where all of that pride and all of that, that, that ego that's driven him is going to be thoroughly broken. And it's only as he gets through that place Here's that, that prophecy of Jesus that becomes very personal. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. That Peter begins to, to sort of really get upset because he is never going to uh, leave Jesus. He's never going to be in a situation where he denied Jesus, according to his own statement. You can imagine that moment when the rooster crowed. You can just imagine that you're standing there as Peter, being warming himself, trying to be an anonymous at at Jesus' uh, arrest and trial. He's standing in the background and people start to, to nominate him as a follower of Jesus. And he denies Jesus three times, getting more vocal and more verbose each time, even bringing down curses on himself. And then the rooster crows. Now, I guess you could preach a whole sermon. We could, we could focus a whole message on and then the rooster crowed. <laughs> because in a sense, it's that moment of truth, isn't it? When when Peter's humanity, when all of his pride, when all of his self-will, even, even good self-will, not destructive, not going out to break all God's laws, but trying to do everything that he could in the power and strength that he had, his determination, his will, his, his bravado was going to take him right through to the end. It wasn't really until the beach on the Sea of Galilee at breakfast time post-resurrection of Jesus that he really, really knew that he was forgiven. And not only so, I have forgiven myself because Jesus made it very personal when he came back into my life. The kind of forgiveness that we're talking about is a restoration of relationship. We often think of forgiveness as kind of a transaction, you know, where you go to court and, and, you, and you're charged as guilty, you're, you're condemned rightfully. Last week we saw that we're not condemned because of Christ. But we often think of forgiveness as being having your debts paid and being being let off. For Peter, there was a sense in which forgiving, being forgiven by Jesus for the wrong he'd done was coupled with the fact that he had also to forgive himself. 
and to understand that, that he needed to forgive himself in order to relate to Jesus again and to have that freedom to love and to follow and to obey without the dread or the shame hanging over him. So to say I have forgiven myself because Jesus has come into my life is a significant part of what it means for the risen Lord to be in our lives. And then I have a relationship with God as Father, just like Jesus showed us and opened the way. And ultimately, ultimately, this is Jesus' purpose. I had someone this week uh, in a conversation we had sort of inferring, I guess, that the, the God of the Old Testament was somehow very different from the God of the New, that the Old Testament God would strike down people and wipe out everyone but Noah and wipe out nations. But this Jesus suddenly comes along and proclaims God and he's merciful and kind and now you can be forgiven. The Old Testament and the New Testament are in the same book. And it's because of Jesus that judgment rightfully given because of sin and because of wrongdoing, the consequence of our rebellion against God is dealt with in Jesus. That's why, that's why we can talk about forgiveness. That's why the risen Lord, the resurrection of Jesus is so powerful and important because now we come into a relationship with God. And then, as Peter said, I've been restored to a purpose in life, to lead God's people and grow them to maturity in Christ. You know, I've experienced in my own life what it means to be called by Jesus, not only to have sins forgiven. And by the way, my sins are pretty fresh. They're not, they're not years old. Uh, sometimes when I stop and reflect, they're only hours old. They're fresh. They haven't reached the use-by date even. They're not even ready to be thrown out. And yet... Sin is something we need to get rid of as soon as possible, as soon as we can out of our lives. But it's beyond that. It's beyond sin being forgiven from our lives. The risen Lord not only forgives us and creates a new life for us and, and, and a place for him to live through us, but he also restores purpose to our lives. So many people in our culture today, so many people in our community today are basically living without a sense of calling and purpose in their lives survival of, of just getting the next paycheck in order to get enough food, in order to pay the mortgage, in order to keep a roof over their heads, all very noble aims. But in the end of the day, there's a sense of despair about that if, if it can all be taken away so quickly. For Peter, Jesus finished these words to him, told him how he would die, that he would die uh, to the glory of the Father. The way in which he would die would be to glorify the Father. And then he just simply closed out that statement to him, that particular encounter with him, with these two words, follow me. And to me, that's, I mean, ultimately, the resurrection of Jesus means that it's not done. We're not over. It's not, it's not finished yet. Life's not over. It's only just beginning in a, in a sense. And following Jesus becomes the, the mantra, the mandate, the, the call on our lives, follow Jesus. I was reading another friend's uh, Facebook page this week. He talked about climbing a mountain. And uh, you can climb any mountain you like in life. And in fact, the view might be good from the top of whatever mountain you, you climb. But for me, I, I suppose the thing that struck me was it's important to climb the right mountain. And it's important not to climb by yourself, but to climb the mountain that Jesus sets before you and to climb with him, to ascend to those heights of spiritual life and growth based on a relationship with Jesus and an ongoing walk with him because he's alive. So it's in the light of that, of Peter's experience, that I want to encourage us all to understand both forgiveness of sin, the dealing with shame, the absolution of guilt, if you like, and the beginning of a new relationship based on humility and dependence on God rather than self-will and bravado an ego of I will or I will never, uh, I'll never fail you, I'll never let you down, Lord, I'm here for you, uh, to Lord, I trust you, Lord, I need you, Lord, I'm dependent upon you, and I'm grateful for a relationship with you. Thankful to uh, Peter for his insights today and uh, for sharing his life with us. I hope you've had uh, some encouragement today and that you also will continue to seek to, to walk uh, with the risen Lord. Uh, let me let me pray for us father thank you so much for for peter's life we know often um, 
we have thought of Peter as being that sort of impetuous person who uh, will do whatever he wants to do, whatever he thinks is the right thing to do and jump in and ask questions later. But we also see a man who was wholehearted in following Jesus. And through that refining process, we see a man who in the end of his days, the end of his life, as far as church history and tradition tells us, glorified God to the very end of his life, writing epistles to us, sharing his life with many, and in the end of the day, giving his life for the sake of the gospel. So we thank you that the transformation that happened to Peter can happen to us, that that restored relationship and purpose can be our experience as well. May your grace and your love and your mercy uh, accompany each of us as we walk this life with Jesus. Amen. Thank you for being with us today and uh, God bless you for another week. Hope that uh, you have a great week and that we're getting one week closer uh, to being together and being able to, to, uh, to share together. Thank you also for all of you uh, who have been supporting the church financially during this time. So valuable, so important, and we do really appreciate it. It's, uh, it keeps the church going. And a reminder, the church is, is not just a, a building or, or programs, but it's people. It's about reaching out and supporting people. And uh, there's many causes that we've committed to. So thank you for that. Let's, uh, let's join together as we sing um, the last song together. Uh, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God.